Hello and welcome to another installment of Grasping Scripture. I'm glad you could join us today as we continue our study, well, right now our study through the book of Revelation. Today we'll be delving into the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation, and I'm glad to have you with us on this journey through God's Word and what for some people is a very challenging book. I know there's a lot in there and it's hard to understand. Hopefully we are working our way through it in a systematic fashion that will help you be able to grasp hold of this text and of its message for you and its message that God has proclaimed through his word throughout all of its existence. Um, if you're new to us, if maybe this is your first foray into listening to the Grasping Scripture podcast, then let me encourage you to back up. Don't dive in with the 14th chapter of Revelation. If you want to start with the book of Revelation, that's fine, but go back to our first episode on the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1. It'll start providing some background and a framework for discussion and understanding the text as we move forward. And you, you really need that background by the time you get to this point in the text, because there are things I will refer back to and things I won't necessarily explain very well because we've explained them more thoroughly in the past. So that being the case, um, glad to have you with us. Look forward to our ongoing study of God's word together. I hope that this study helps you to truly grasp hold of scripture and lay claim to everything God has for you there. All the encouragement, all the correction and rebuke, everything we need in, in growing in our faith in Christ to hear the voice of God through his word. Uh, hopefully this is a time that will help you on that journey. Well, again, thanks for joining us. Let's turn to the Lord as we begin our study today of chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your grace and mercy. Lord, as we are keenly aware that we needed a Savior, and you and your love for us provided that Savior in Jesus the Christ. And Lord, as we read this book that is full of such vivid imagery and, and grand scale, Father, throughout all of it, we still hear the message of your love and your grace your redemption of a fallen and broken humanity. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you that your love for us, your love for your creation motivated you to save, to seek and to save that which was lost. Father, thank you for including us in your work, that we have the opportunity to proclaim your name, to share the message of the good news, the gospel about Jesus the Christ. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word, that we can study it individually or together, that we can hear your voice speaking to us. And Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that is sensitive to the promptings of your spirit. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Well, as we are at the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation, uh, we need to maybe step back, get a little perspective, lay the groundwork for what's happening. We've been going through the seven seals, the seven trumpets. Uh, now we've been dealing with the seven signs or symbols. And all of these, we've kind of taken the approach of understanding them as uh, almost a nesting doll type scenario that you have multiple judgment accounts or great and terrible day of the Lord accounts, be that chapter eight, verse five, chapter 11, verse 19. We get into it in the latter part of chapter 14. We'll get to it again in chapter 16. It keeps coming up, but for our discussion, we're looking at it as a retelling of the same events from differing perspectives. Think four gospels, all telling us of Christ, but doing it from a different perspective and with a different flavor. We've seen in the seven seals, the uh, horsemen uh, that are mentioned out of Zechariah and that kind of playing out. 
when we got to the seven trumpets, we see this Exodus framework coming into play. As we get into the seven signs, which all unpack under the the two witnesses and that time period of the rise of the beast of Daniel 7, um, they're out of chapters 10 and 11. All of this packs into that, and we see this cosmic battle uh, between the red dragon and and the beautiful woman and her offspring and all that that means. You can go back to chapter 12 and, and un, unfurl all that's contained in that. Then in chapter 13, we dealt with the earthly battle, what was going on on earth. And there's the mark of the beast and all of that that comes into play there. And we see the rise of these different beasts. We see the rise of the beast out of the ocean. We see the rise of the false prophet. We have this, if you will, trinity of evil, uh, kind of as opposed to the trinity that is a God, that is God. And Then we get into chapter 14 and chapter 14, it's already gone through the episode of you have to take the mark of the beast on hand, forehead, if you want to do business, if you want to do any of these things, we get to 14 and there's this shift. 14 is a dividing line, if you will. Uh, Rome in the text of Babylon, which is a veiled reference to Rome at the time, but not so much the empire of Rome, although that would have been what they understood at that point in time, as John is writing this to the early believers, the persecuted church. It's not just Rome. It's a representation. Rome represents any earthly power, any governmental, political, earthly human power that is entrusted with this authority, this, you know, Yeah, I know there's political overtones to that because we're talking about political might. Rome was a political military entity and there's an allegiance to Rome, which was declaring Caesar as God. And you were called on as Roman citizens to worship Caesar. The Christians had to make a choice. Am I going to worship Christ as God or Caesar? And they were being persecuted and executed for not doing so. That's the framework going on here when this text is given to the early church as an encouragement to the church, but also as a call to action for the early church. There was a decision they had to make and take action on. We'll get to that in a minute. So as we get into 14, the first part of 14, we're going to see a description of the Lamb's army, the Lamb and the 144,000. And we've talked about that 144,000, whether it's a literal number or symbolic number in previous chapters, you can go back, cover that, but it's, it's symbolic. Okay. We get into new Jerusalem and some things along those lines. We will also in this chapter, get into another final judgment account. And there's a couple of harvest that take place. He's using a harvest motif in this expression of the final judgment. So, Now we're going to delve into this chapter and we're going to see what's here for us and really, really chew on some of this. So I welcome you along for this journey. Let's begin by looking at the first part of chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 14 starts out this way. It says, Then I saw the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of a mighty ocean waves or the rolling of loud thunder. It was like the sound of many harpists playing together. Now, I'll keep reading because there's more to this, but I need to stop and point out a detail. He sees the lamb standing on Mount Zion, Who's the Lamb? Christ. Uh, Mount Zion represents that earthly power seat of God. It's where the temple was, where the Holy of Holies was. Although now we understand the throne room of God to be in heaven. And who were the 44,000? Well, that's a 12 times 12 reference there. You know, tribes of Israel, maybe apostles um, altogether. 
there's a lot of symbolism there, but it seem it seems to represent throughout the book of Revelation that 144,000 as a complete or a wholeness of the number of those that belong to God, not a literal number. There's only 144,000 that will be saved and with God. No, um, but it's more symbolic numerically to represent the the perfect, the complete number. So, and there may be hints of 12 tribes and some things like that there. Um, but take that number as a symbolic for complete or whole or all that are supposed to be sort of thing. So there he sees them. And what's the distinctive of this, this army, this gathering with the lamb on Mount Zion? They have something written on their forehead. Now, this is in direct contrast to what we saw in 13, where those that served Babylon, those that worshiped the beast, had written on their foreheads or on their hand the number or mark of the beast, which we un unpacked to say was probably a reference to Nero, ergo Rome. Here, what's written on their foreheads is something very different. It is the name of the Lamb and of the Father. Yeah, it is a direct reference to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three in one. It is that, that holy union there. So again, we're starting to see this contrast between the Lamb. This is the Lamb who was slain, who now stands there. And his mark being upon those that are his. So there's two camps, two marks. There's nobody walking around without a mark. You're in one camp or the other. And that's that division point there. You have to choose. And throughout the next part of the chapter, we're going to see that this chapter is very much about you must choose who you will worship, who you will follow it echoes Joshua, choose today whom you will serve. Um, and that's not accidental. And it's very much directed at the early church, at those early believers as they were being persecuted, because some were deciding I'm going to serve Rome because it's going to be easier. If I don't, they're going to kill me or they're going to take everything I have, or they're going to lock me up and torture me. Others, it was, no, there's not a choice here. I'm serving Christ no matter what. And that distinction, that uh, choice, decision point is being presented to the early church in very, very graphic images here. Now, is it only talking to the early church? No, it's talking to the church throughout its days until the great day of the Lord that is coming. We all face that challenge, that decision. Let's get back on track with the passage. We've covered verses one and two. Now we're going to pick up with three. There was this, this great sound, this, this uh, like mighty ocean waves or loud thunder. It was the sound of many, like many harpists playing all together. Verse three, this great chorus sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God and before the four living beings and the 24 elders. So there we got that image of the throne room of God again. And there's this great multitude, this, this huge chorus singing this new song before God. It says no one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. This is the song of the redeemed. What is this song? We don't know. John doesn't tell us. Those that are redeemed from the earth are those that have already died in Christ. But for those left on the earth, there's still that don't know yet, but it's coming and it's going to be awesome. He goes on. They have kept themselves as pure as virgins following the lamb wherever he goes. Now, pure as virgins there. Uh, actually, as you delve into a more literal translation of it, uh, it refers to men being as pure as virgins. And the, the imagery there 
is taking this 144,000 and acknowledging them like a bride. Think church, bride of Christ, made pure, standing before him. Yeah, that's not accidental imagery there. Uh, It's pointing towards this being the church, this being the redeemed of Christ. And they have been made pure and they follow him. They have kept themselves as pure as virgins, following the lamb wherever he goes. They've stayed faithful. Um, They have been purchased from among the people on the earth as a special offering or literally a first fruits offering that that offering that was given, acknowledging that God gave this as a gift and it is a sampling that he will give more, that there's more coming. But I want to put my faith in there being more coming by giving the first of what he has given to me back. These are a special offering, a first fruit to God and to the lamb. They have told no lies. They are without blame. They stand blameless before God. They are not liars. They are not deceptive. They are made holy by Christ. And they are faithful in following him. Now, that's just the first, what, five verses. We have that set up, that that army of the Lamb, that 144,000, they are proclaiming that song that, that only they know the words to in the throne room of God, praising God, and they are marked as His, and they are pure, and they follow Him. And that's where it leaves us at the end of verse 5. Now, as six picks up, we have this image of angels and angels proclaiming judgment and blessing over the earth. So let's look at what's going on here. Uh, there's, There's some neat images in this. In verse six, and I saw another angel fly through the sky, carrying the eternal good news to proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. So what has happened? You have this world in which there is worship of this unholy trinity of the the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, where there's allegiance given to them and a mark placed upon people, or they can choose to follow God. In the midst of that, the slain lamb stands with the army of the redeemed, those that have gone into heaven, those that have been taken from this earth in the presence of God, singing in that course of the redeemed. Interesting. Their mode of battle is to sing praises to God. That's going on. And then John sees this angel flying through the sky, carrying the eternal good news and proclaiming to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. So here we have this angel coming through, declaring the gospel, the good news, literally it means gospel, the gospel of Christ to the world, a lost, fallen, twisted, worshiping the beast world. But the gospel is proclaimed every nation, tribe, language, and people that belong to this world. Fear God, he shouted. Give glory to him, for the time comes when he will sit as judge. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all the springs of water. So proclaiming he's God over everything, worship him, because the day of judgment is coming. Time is running out. This is an opportunity to turn to Christ, to receive salvation. In verse 8, it says, Then another angel followed him through the sky, shouting, Babylon is fallen. And here again, Babylon had fallen by that point uh, in world history. But Babylon perceived probably to be a veiled, not real veiled, but slightly veiled reference to Rome but also is a reference in a more general sense to governmental political power 
earthly systems of power. Babylon has fallen. That thing that people were placing their faith in instead of Christ. Giving their worship and allegiance to instead of to Christ. That's Babylon. At that point, Babylon looked like Rome. In our day, Babylon looks probably like something else. But it's still there. Here, this angel is proclaiming, look, Babylon has fallen. The domain of the beast, it's over. It has fallen. The great city has fallen because she made all the nations of the world drink the wine of her passionate immorality. So you have the redeemed, the 144,000 who have kept themselves pure and loyal to God, following him, trusting in Christ. And then you have the world who is hearing the gospel message and being called to repentance, called to relationship with Christ, and it being pointed out, look, what you were worshiping is bankrupt. It's gone. Babylon has fallen. The city is gone. That great city has fallen. Why? Because she made all the nations of the world drink the wine of her passionate immorality. Such a contrast to those that are pure and follow Christ. And where that leads versus where worship of anything other than God leads. Destruction, failure. But there's a third angel. It says, then a third angel followed them shouting, Anyone who worships the beast and his statue or who accepts the mark on the forehead or the hand must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured full strength into God's cup of wrath. And they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the lamb. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever and they will have no relief night or excuse me day or night for they have worshiped the beast and his statue and as have accepted the mark of his name this means verse 12 this means that god's holy people must endure persecution patiently obeying his commands and maintaining their faith in jesus do you realize what John just did for us? You may be going, well, I'm not so sure about this mark of the beast and, and all of that and taking the mark. And he just explained it in verse 12. What, what does all that mean? It means this. This means God's holy people, because let's face it, those that do not know Christ don't care about what the book of Revelation says in chapter 14 about obedience to Christ and following him. That's just the reality of it. They don't know Christ, so they don't really care what Christ calls them to. But for those that know God, for God's holy people, this means that God's holy people must endure persecution patiently, obeying his commands, and maintaining their faith in Christ. We have a God that we obey or a God that we disobey. We either worship Christ with all we are, all we have. Think Shema, think greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God, all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. All you are and all you have. Or we worship something else with all we are and all we have. Even if we say, oh, I'm a Christian, but we live our lives worshiping something other than Christ, dedicating our energies, our attentions, our efforts towards something other than Christ. We are not worshiping Christ at that point. We worship something else. And anything else falls in the domain of the beast. The only thing that is Christ is Christ. We can't almost get there. Well, I worship something that was good. I invested all my time and efforts and obedience to something that's good. Isn't that good enough? No, it's not. It's Christ or nothing. 
It is Jesus that said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It's exclusive. It's Jesus or it's wrong. That's it. That's the reality. Well, going on in verse 13. He says, and I heard a voice. So the third angel has gone, made that proclamation. He says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit. They are blessed indeed, for they will rest from their hard work, for their good deeds follow them. What does that mean? It means that there is a blessing in facing persecution for God. They're facing that persecution up to death. We may go, yeah, but that's awful. It is in this life, but there's so much more than this life. And he's saying there is rest and there is reward in the kingdom to come. It's not just about this life. And you can compromise in this life. You can worship something other than Jesus, give your allegiance to something other than Jesus, and you will suffer for it throughout eternity. Or you can accept the message of the gospel of being made right with God through Christ, and you can live for him no matter how unpleasant that may be in this world. And know that you will have blessing and rest throughout eternity. What's the choice? I mean, really, if those are the two options, and they are the only two options, then then where's the choice in that? I mean, it seems like a no-brainer. So again, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they are blessed indeed, for they will rest from their hard work for their good deeds Follow them. Hmm. Doesn't that passage challenge us? I know it challenges me. I read that and I think, wow, does that describe me? Does that describe my faith in Christ, my obedience to Christ? My willingness to, <clears throat> to live for him? What about you? Does it describe you? Now we hit a turning point in chapter 14. That first part was the description of the two groups. You've got those with allegiance to the beast and and those with allegiance to the lamb. And, and the distinctions are drawn between the two groups. You have the angels, the three angels flying over, making proclamation, one proclaiming the gospel, one proclaiming the, the demise of, of Babylon, and the third one calling to commitment those who trust in the Lord. Now we get to the harvest, and there are two harvests. There's a grain harvest, and there is a grape harvest. Now, that wouldn't have been foreign to them in the first century world. Those were two common and, and highly used crops. But in the imagery here, we've already had reference to the, the sour grapes of God's anger being poured into his cup of wrath, and it's coming. You know, that was a warning of judgment that was given by one of the angels. But the harvest, the grain harvest, that scene is a harvest of the kingdom. The fields are white in the harvest. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the field. It's, it's that, that harvesting of the redeemed. God drawing to him those that are his. Those are the two images we're going to see presented here. Let's look at them. In verse 14, it says... Then I saw a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was someone like the Son of Man. Now, Son of Man, biblical reference to Christ. Is this Christ? I'm going to say probably not, because it goes on to refer to him as an angel. Um, 
Then I saw a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was someone like the Son of Man. He had a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. So it may be Jesus, the crown being that symbol of authority. What's with the sickle? Um, implement for harvesting, okay? There's no hidden meaning here, reference to the USSR, you know, okay, we're not going there. This is pretty straightforward. Then I saw a white cloud seated on the cloud with someone like the Son of Man. He had a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came from the temple and shouted to the one sitting on the cloud, Swing the sickle, for the time of harvest has come. The crop on earth is ripe. So, I said that may be an angel. As I'm reading this again, I'm thinking, no, that's not an angel. That's Jesus. Now, he receives a message from an angel, and I have a little bit of problem with an angel shouting at Jesus, telling him what to do, but it would be a message from the Father. And Jesus talked about no man knows the time of his return, only the Father, and then gave an illustration about a, a groom, and the groom doesn't know when the wedding is and when to go get the bride until the Father says the preparations are made, it's time, go. Uh, kind of see that happening here. This is that it's time, go episode. So the son of man seated on the cloud, sickle in hand, the angel says, swing that sickle or no, swing the sickle for the time of harvest has come. The crop on earth is ripe. What crop on earth? Those that responded to that proclamation of the gospel those that have become the redeemed. It's time for the harvest. So the one sitting on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the whole earth was harvested. After that, another angel came from the temple in heaven, the temple that referenced the throne room of God, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel who had power to destroy with fire came from the altar. He shouted to the angel with a sharp sickle, swing your sickle now to gather the clusters of grapes. So we've got two beings with sickles. One we're going to say is Jesus on the cloud wearing the crown. He is Lord. He reigns. He is taking a harvest from the whole earth. It is the grain harvest. Again, the grain representing the redeemed. Now there's another angel that comes and the angel that has the, um, the power to destroy with fire came from the altar and tells the angel with the sickle, not the one on the cloud, that's Christ, but the other angel with the sickle. He shouted to the angel with the sharp sickle, swing your sickle now and gather the clusters of grapes from the vines of the earth, for they are ripe for judgment. See, there's two harvests. There's a harvest of the grain, which are the redeemed, and there's the harvest of the grapes, which are ripe for judgment. In this scenario, the grapes are the unredeemed. They are the lost. They are those that did not turn to Christ, but instead worship the beast. Again, no middle ground. You're one camp or the other. There's no undecided category. You're either with Christ or you are against Christ. You either worship Christ or you worship the beast. By default, that's it. Swing your sickle now, gather the clusters of grapes from the vines of the earth, for they are ripe for judgment. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and loaded the grapes into a great wine pr- into the great wine press of God's wrath. Now wine presses were built in the first century world out on the outskirts of the cities. Um, there are various reasons for that, but they would they usually were constructed outside the perimeter of the community. And that's where the grapes were brought and they were crushed out for the juice to flow and be collected and made into wine. Well, here we're talking about the grapes representing the unredeemed from the world being harvested and placed into this great wine press. Now, this is everybody, okay? Between the harvest of the grain and the harvest of the grapes, this is everybody. 
this is the great and terrible day of the Lord. This is the final judgment and they are being divided. You, the redeemed, you not. And the grapes are harvested and they're brought to this great wine press of God's wrath. The grapes are trampled in the wine press outside the city. The blood, not the grape juice, the blood, because the grapes represent the people, the lost. The blood flowed from the wine press in a stream about 180 miles long and as high as a horse's bridle. Ooh. Literally, it says 1,600 stadia, or it's almost 300 kilometers if you're metric. But, um, wow, 180 miles. That is to represent complete total uh, destruction, total pouring out of God's wrath and that it will cut blood represented life, that this was life flowing away. Um, this was God's judgment on those rejecting him and it was massive and it is part of the horror and torment that await those who bear the burden of the guilt of their sin. But remember the message of the gospel was that you don't have to bear the burden of the guilt of your sin. Your sins can be forgiven and you could be made whole. You could be made a new creation. You could be made pure and clean. It's a redemptive message but it's not without an expiration date. There is coming this day, this day when the earth will be harvested and the redeemed, the grain will be gathered unto God and God's wrath will be poured out on everyone else. Anyone can be in the redeemed. If you will turn to Christ, confessing that you're a sinner, asking for his forgiveness. Scripture tells us if you will call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. It doesn't have to end with that wine press of God's wrath, but it will if you don't turn to him. If you have turned to him, stay faithful. Stay committed. Do not compromise that faith. Do not claim to follow Christ for a season and then turn away and worship something, anything else. Because what you are doing at that point is worshiping the beast and not the Savior. And that horrendous gruesome image of the blood flowing from the wine press for 180 miles as deep as a horse's bridle. That's where the chapter ends. That speaks of the finality of the judgment of God. The New Testament tells us that God is holding off on bringing his day of judgment to give the lost more time to repent and turn to him. If you're, if you're in this study, if you're listening to this podcast and you don't know Christ, understand time is limited, but his invitation is open to you turn to him today. If you know Christ, stay faithful to him and be strengthened by the knowledge that no matter what you face in this life, should you face even persecution and death for your allegiance to Christ, there are glories that await. Eternity is a blessing and a rest 
in Christ, but it is torment. It is literally hell apart from Christ. Cling to the Savior. Stand with the redeemed. Long for that day that we will stand in his presence and sing that song that only the 144,000 know the words of. It will be a great day of the Lord and a terrible day for those apart from him. The message of Revelation is a message of choice. That there is a choice that must be made. It is a message of encouragement that victory has been won. God is victorious. The lamb that was slain now stands. And that the day of judgment is coming. We will either cling to the lamb or what we cling to will be meaningless. We should find strength and encouragement in Christ. We as believers should find our peace in Christ, not in the world, not in favor from the world or a sense of security, but we need to stand firm in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for the grace and mercy we find in Christ. We thank you for the encouragement from your word to stand and the the promise of hope and blessing and peace and rest in you. And Father, we pray that the the gruesome nature of this message, this, this, this profound description of God's wrath and judgment would motivate us out of love for our brothers and sisters that do not know Christ. Father, that we would be motivated out of love to share with them, to understand the days are limited and we need to make the most of the opportunity that you've given us, that your name would be proclaimed everywhere to all people. Lord, help us to be faithful in that task and to be sound in our commitment, our allegiance to you, that we worship you, that we stand clean, pure as we follow you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.